Okay, did it, yes, I see the captions now. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Robert. Have a good one. Carl, thanks. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Culture Connection Speaker Series, where we're talking with Americans who have made careers in Russian studies, who share their interest and knowledge in Russian art, society, culture, and history. We'll see how American attitudes and tastes have changed over the years, and how Americans are connecting on a cultural level with Russia. My name is Michael Beckelheimer, and I'm joining you from Washington, D.C. This program is presented by the American Center of Moscow, supported by the American Embassy in Moscow. If you're watching on the American Center's YouTube, VK, or Telegram channels, please post comments and questions at any time. We love to get your questions, ask about anything. We're talking about a lot today. Um, and for, for Russian subtitles, you can select closed captioning in Russian. So Ingrid, our guest today is Dr. Ingrid Kleespies. Associate Professor of Russian Studies at the University of Florida. She received her undergraduate degree in Slavic Studies from Harvard and her graduate degrees from the University of California at Berkeley. Her, in, her areas of interest include Russian Romanticism, Russian intellectual history, 18th and 19th century Russian literature and culture, and literature of travel and empire. Ingrid, welcome to the series and thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Michael. It's my pleasure. So today we'll be talking about a few different topics and they're all related in some way. Actually, Ingrid, they're all related through you. <laughs> um, today we're talking about Ivan Goncharov, Oblomov, Siberia, the American Wild West, Sergei Aksakov, Lev Tolstoy, and Isabel Hapgood, the first American woman, I think the first, who made a career as an expert in Russia or on Russia about 125 years ago. But first, Ingrid, I would like to start with this photo on the screen. This is you in 2003 at the Red October Chocolate Factory. What were you doing? Uh, sure, so and I'm, I'm third from left. Um, so in 2003, I was uh, finishing my PhD at Berkeley. And I did a summer program through um, ACTR, American Councils of Teachers of Russian, uh, which was for teachers of Russian. It was like a refresher program. So I spent about six weeks in Moscow. It was a pretty intensive um, language program, but we also had some excursions that came along with the program that were planned. I'm not, I have to say, I don't quite remember how we ended up at the Red October Chocolate Factory, but it was an extremely fun and memorable event um, where we got to go. I've never had an experience like this before or since onto the main floors of the factory. And there's all these conveyor belts with chocolates and they told us, have whatever you want, just take it off the belt, you can eat it. If you don't like it, you throw it in this bucket over here in the corner. Um, and so we were, everyone was having a lot of fun and they, we had to wear the coats and the hats. And I don't know if our audience would be familiar with the American, very popular American movie from the 1970s, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Um, but in it, there's the famous scene of the midgets, the Oompa Loompas who do a funny like Oompa Loompa song <laughs> as they work in the chocolate factory. So we were acting that out in this picture. Um, but what I have to say was very fun about that whole event was just the kind of the freedom to try all the chocolates. And then um, we'd already eaten quite a bit, but at the end they brought us into a special room and they said, and now it's time 
for chayapitya, the, the tea drinking. And each of us had a ta place at the table and we had about 10 pounds of chocolate for, for each person. So um, by the end of this day, I still remember we st staggered out to a bench outside, like in a park outside and literally sat there for an hour groaning because our stomachs hurt so much, but it was an amazing day. <laughs> That, so it was really that sounds like a dream come true. Actually. It kind of was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And there's some there's good chocolate in Russia. There and I think in the, in the 2000s there were there was a blossoming of of chocolate. But Red October is one of the good old yes. standby brands. And they make those classic ones like Misha Kosalapi and Karakum, and they're just wonderful. Both the chocolates and the wrappers. I actually saved mm -hmm. some of them. So it works awesome. Yeah. So how did you get interested in Russia? Briefly, let's. What, what was your background? Sure. So I do not have any family background in Russian. Um, and I grew up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is, you know, is kind of a more, maybe I would say, education focused part of the country. Uh, but the, the main story was that I was in high school and I was interested in learning languages. And somebody came to our school, I went to a public high school, and they said, well, we're going to introduce Russian in the school. This was in the late 1980s. So it was kind of this late Cold War period. And I went home and I told my parents, oh, I'm, I want to learn Russian. <laughs> and my dad said, no, you should do something more practical, like learn German. <laughs> to this day, I'm always wondering why he thought German was more practical. But um, as soon as he said no, I just decided, yes, I'm going to do it. So I decided to start learning and I just fell in love with it. It was really fun. Um, we had a wonderful teacher. It was a very exciting time. Um, and uh, we also, our teacher organized an exchange with us in 1989 in April, where we went to Yaroslav for two weeks and to Moscow and what was then Leningrad. Um, so yeah, this is a picture when I was 16 and um, at the school in Yaroslav that when we first arrived. And I always like this picture because it captures the sense I had at the time of just this whirlwind of like excitement and all these really interesting people and things in this totally new world that had been uh, something I didn't really know anything about, but was really interesting to them. And this is also in the school. <laughs> and we often were in class during the two weeks with little kids because I think everyone thought that maybe we would be able to understand a little bit more. Um, but it was really fun. And just the classroom environment was very warm. Everyone was really excited to have us there. And uh, it was really very something I would have never imagined I would get to do growing up um, in that, you know, before the late 1980s, it didn't seem like a possibility to go to the Soviet Union. Um, and really, I would say that it was from that time I just I got hooked. I just really wanted to learn more and I wanted to understand. It was hard going there um, when I'd only had a year of Russian and I didn't understand anything that was going on around me. So I really wanted to learn more. That's yeah. amazing that you got to study Russian there um, as a high school student. Mm -hmm. be exposed to it. Yeah, and it wasn't for very long, but it was mm -hmm. exciting. So. And did you learn how to do this dance? No, <laughs> I wish we had. But we had, I mean, the school went all out. They had concerts every day. Um, it was really an amazing um, display. Uh, and then I should say that the Soviet students who we visited, they came to Cambridge, Massachusetts about a month later, also for two weeks. So then we, you know, it's very different in an American high school. It would you know, it's not the norm that you would put on a, a concert like this. Um, so we had to kind of really think about, well, what can we do to demonstrate American culture for our Soviet visitors? Um, something that would be comparative. And uh, and that was really a bit of a challenge, actually. But we did manage. I think we had a, a folk dancing event um, at one point where we were learning as much as our visitors. So I was going to say that's we, we have folk dancing, but I wouldn't really call that <laughs> a big part of our culture. <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah, <laughs> we have yeah. to learn it. Yes. <laughs> um, what, were, what were their impressions in the late 80s when they came to Cambridge? I think um, it, it was very interesting for them because it was just such a different environment physically in many ways, as well as culturally. Um, just the difference. Cambridge is a city, but it's one in which families tend to live in single family homes, not apartments. Um, so I think that was a big change for people. Um, I had a lot of our visitors, they were interested actually, you know, in going to places like Radio Shack and having possibility to buy technology and, and mm -hmm. you know, things like that. Um, and I think they were just, they were, when I think back on it, I think none of us really were completely sure how to process it all, but it was just like this enormous, huge impression overall um, of stuff that was extremely interesting and different. 
Mm -hmm. um, I should say for me, it was the first time I had left the US was when I went to the Soviet Union. So I, it was everything all at once, like the first time I went to a different country, um, and then to go to this place I had always heard so much about, but didn't know and didn't seem very real until I, I went there. And I, I think for our Soviet visitors, there was something very similar going on. That's interesting. So adventuresome. And then you you were totally boring and stayed in town for college. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I know. Well, it happened that way. Um, and I, because of that, I actually was very determined to spend a semester abroad. And um, I had actually started out as an anthropology major at Harvard, but it didn't leave enough time in my schedule to keep taking Russian. And I really was just, like I said, very hooked on learning the language. And uh, so I decided to switch to becoming a Russian major. Um, and then that meant I was able to do a semester abroad and that was in the spring of 1993. So there was a big difference from 1989 to 1993. Things obviously had changed a lot in Russia in the meantime. Um, and, uh, and I had also gotten a bit older, so it was a different experience, but uh, one that has meant so much to me. And I think that really launched my entire career. Without that semester, um, I'm not sure that I would be where I am today. So. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. and I think this picture is from 1993. Yeah. Um, yes. I think we actually had made a trip to um, to Yalta and we met these guys on the street and they were very excited, you know, and this is something I remember from that time period in general, 1989, 1993. Uh, on our exchange in 1989, we were driving on a bus from Moscow to Leningrad and we stopped by the side of the road. I think there was a rest stop and there were a bunch of uh, soldiers there who were just going somewhere else. And they wanted to meet us because they had never met Americans before. And so, and, and when I say this story today, it sounds like impossible, like mm -hmm. so kind of hokey and, and not possible, but it was really an exciting time. It felt like this big deal to meet each other. Um, and I think that was sort of also what the feeling was here, that it was exciting and you, you know, you needed to take a picture of it because it was a big deal. It was so interesting. I, I definitely don't advise you to go to Yalta and find some soldiers today. No, definitely not. <laughs> yeah. It's a different time right now. Yeah, yeah. Those are such, a, such an impressionable period and such an interesting time. I think it it hooked us all, and that's that's the inspiration for this speaker series, and that's that's why you're here. Um, another reason why you're here is because I'm a huge fan of, of Goncharov's book Oblomov, and I'm not alone. And but we don't often talk about that book, and not not many Americans are familiar with that book. Um, but I was hoping to talk to you about your recent work um, studying Goncharov, and I was going to um, because you recently edited co-edited a book called Goncharov in the 21st Century. So before we talk about Oblomov, I wanted to ask you who is Goncharov to you, and what was the um, importance or the need for this book. Um, what is who is Goncharov in the twenty first century? Mm -hmm. Well, those and those are both great questions, and I I may have slightly different answers for both of them. I didn't discover Goncharov until graduate school uh, when we read Oblomov in one of my graduate seminars, and I had never heard of it. So it's it's such a I use the term sleeper here intentionally, sleeper novel <laughs> about a sleeper, right? But it's um, it's very <laughs> very not well known outside of Russia, which is surprising. Um, and I think, um, you know, on the one hand, I, it really resonated with me as someone who was at times struggling to think like, well, was I doing the right career? Did I want to do it? Was I productive enough? And, you know, I used to kind of think of myself sometimes as the abloma of, of academics who is, you know, <laughs> trailing along in the back and maybe not doing everything I needed to do. Um, so I think that Oblomov's travails with wouldn't be what we would today call depression and um, kind of motivational issues was definitely something that resonated for me personally. But I think that Gunsharov as a, on the whole is just this amazing author um, whose work touches on such contemporary issues uh, that it's always astonishing to me that he doesn't get more um, play even within Russian um, society and Russian culture. He's he's some such an interesting figure you know he comes from this merchant background he's not an aristocrat so he's never able to um just write he has to work for a living uh and so he worked actually in the civil service but actually as a censor so um which is a really interesting position for a writer to be in um and then uh so he's always a bit on the outside and i think he he struggled with that feeling always that he doesn't belong to the circle of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and Turgenev. Um, 
but he's also kind of almost like this Victorian era gentleman, you know, in 19th century Russia. It's one reason why I picked this image of him. It's like the perfect image of this almost bourgeois author with his little lapdog who's really interested in modernity. And it's a modernity that we recognize now that's about visual representation. So for him, it's like this encounter with photography and um, various kind of new technologies of the era, like the kaleidoscope, you know, not something we think of as very exciting today, but was a big deal. Uh, he's also really interested in women's roles, and that really comes through in Oblomov and also um, The Precipice, uh, that, you know, he he sees, you know, a kind of world which is changing and one in which women should have a, a greater presence. Um, and he's also really kind of writing about and in complicated and interesting ways about kind of industrialization and an emerging market economy in Russia in the mid-19th century. So um, I find him fascinating for those reasons. He is fascinating. So where did where did Oblomov come from? Where did that character come from? Um, I think it was deeply autobiographical for Goncharov. He um, he actually struggled at times himself to get out of bed, just like okay. Oblomov does. Yeah. And, you know, I'm always careful about using psychological terminology to sort of diagnose someone from over 100 years ago. But he obviously struggled with depression um, and, you know, didn't have the tools we might have today to, to kind of handle that. Um, but yeah, so Oblomov is a very autobiographical character. Uh, at the same time, um, I think he was also writing about the end of an era. He's writing it sort of in the immediate decades after emancipation and the end of serfdom. And he is thinking about, you know, these, these leftover fragments, these, you know, Oblomov comes from the word for fragment, who don't really have a path into the new reality or into the new modernity. And he's both kind of nostalgic in some ways for that past, but also quite critical of it. And I think that's what makes him such a compelling writer is that it's not black and white for him. It's um, these are complicated uh, transition period in Russian history. Yeah. And that's probably what makes Oblomov such a such an interesting character that we can all relate to. I mean, wouldn't we all rather just go to sleep, <laughs> think about the past, and not worry about the future? And by the way, I don't think I think I have you beat as the the bigger Oblomov <laughs> because you're a professor of Russian studies now, and I'm asking you questions. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I try to overcome my Oblomovshina, <laughs> you know, as much as I can. Yeah, yeah. it's still a struggle yeah. for me yeah. every day. Yeah. So, um. He went on, well, by the way, do you teach Oblomov to your students? I do on occasion. I, I don't teach it as much as some other things, but I love to teach it. They really, really like it. At first, they have no idea what it is and what it's about. But for students who are coming to the end of their childhood and they have to think about work and career, this novel is really profoundly relevant to them. And these struggles of like, well, once I start working, how do I live my life? How do I have a full life if I'm consumed by a career? Um, so those those things really matter. But also Abloma's relationship with his love interest, Olga, really gets the students going because it's definitely dysfunctional. Um, and a lot of them, I think, see echoes in their own lives or in their friends' lives. And they get very uh, invested in talking about <laughs> in talking about that so it's a lot of fun that's that's awesome um so another book that he wrote um Friga Palada is a, about his trip around the world as a as a as a government secretary on this um mission around the world to reach American uh, the Russian colonies in America and establish trade um with Japan neither of which happened but he did go on this amazing trip and then wrote a book about it. And in the book, he, the narrator of this tale is, um, although it's a very, from what I understand, a very documentary book about, you know, based on Goncharov's notes from this trip, but he wrote it from the point of view of, of an Oblomov character or maybe Oblomov himself. Can you tell us about this book? Sure, yeah, no, I love Frigat Palada. Um, so it's really, even so just like you're saying he writes about it at times from an oblomov like voice or an oblomov like narrator um given what i was just saying about goncharov's autobiographical connections to the character of oblomov 
it's very surprising that he ended up going on a round the world trip that lasted three years, you know, it was from 1852 to 1855. Um, it was a little bit of a surprise to him. He was invited to go as the secretary in the sort of official capacity, and he wasn't sure if he should go. And then he did decide to go. But I think it was, he was not, Gonshurov himself was not a natural traveler. So this was, it was challenging for him at times um, to do it and to be away from sort of hominess and home comforts. Uh, but at the same time, it's just this incredible opportunity. And, you know, the 1850s is this time where, you know, the British empire is expanding and um, there's all this sort of competition in the far what in the U.S. we think of as the Far East between Russia, Britain, and the U.S. Um, so this is, he's an incredible observer of those dynamics. Uh, and in part because they start out by going to London. So they, they start at kind of the center of the British Empire, uh, but then they end up going around the Cape of Good Hope, um, going to, to Asia, Singapore, they, they get to Japan. Um, but uh, if people remember their history, the American Commodore Perry actually has gotten there first and the U.S. was much more willing to use military force against the Japanese uh, than the Russians were. Um, so the Russians kind of observed more what the Americans were doing and were sort of interested in trying to also have trade relations, but it's it's a bit challenging and their mission gets frustrated by the outbreak of the Crimean War, which means they cannot sail back the way they came. They would definitely be captured. Um, and in addition, the ship they were on was needed uh, for the, the military effort. So they make a decision to go from Japan just back to the mouth of the Amur River on the coast of Siberia. And they basically dump the, the people there, like Gunshot and everyone. Um, and it's 1855. So this is extremely challenging conditions physically. And it took about six months to get back to Petersburg from there. Um, so they went overland. And at times, they're literally were going on foot. And at other times, Gonchorov, who was not always the most physically fit, he had to be carried like in a sling by a couple of men. Um, so it was really a very, there weren't roads, you know, or the rivers were frozen, or, you know, there just weren't easy ways to actually travel. Um, and so for him, he has a lot of kind of a of like nostalgia for the comforts of home during all of this. Um, but it's really fascinating to read his observations of the different places he goes, Japan, um, you know, different places in Africa. I mean, it's it's really amazing. Um, talk a little bit about what he experienced in London. Was that his, so this was his first time ever in the Western world? Yes, it is his first time abroad. Um, and London in the 1850s, it's a kind of heyday of, um, well, this sort of uh, imperial consciousness in some ways, but also of, um, and I have to say this kind of visual revolution. Uh, and I think we feel like we're living through that right now. And in some ways we are with uh, Facebook and AI and all kinds of like visual platforms, but something very similar was happening in the mid 19th century. Uh, so for Gonshorov, he gets to London and you know, the, the, um, the Crystal Palace, was open. Um, there are all kinds of shows going on. There's all kinds of museums. Everywhere you go, there's some sort of display. And a lot of it is part of this effort on the part of like the English government to educate the population and to say, okay, we all have to be scientists now and we all have to understand how to evaluate and assess things every, from, from people to things. So it's a lot of um, kind of uncomfortable observation of humans. It's, you know, it's like this anthropological logical gaze that uh, Gonshorov is encountering. And he's both, you know, in some sense as a European traveler, he's participating in that. But then as a Russian visitor in London, he also feels that he's the object um, of scrutiny. So he's constantly walking a line between those things. And um, the interesting thing is that in real life, he admired a lot about English society, but in Frigga Palada, he also is very critical of some of these aspects of modernity and um, what is how is it, it is dehumanizing um, to those who are the object of scrutiny. Um, and he's so he's really, it's a very interesting um, take on British and English society. He did sees that, it. Did, did, I'm sorry, did that impact his own view of his identity as a Russian? I mean, because this was a period you know, where, where writers especially were exploring issues of Russian national identity. And here he is in this completely foreign place, feeling like he's an object of observation. What did this do to his own sense of Russianness? 
Um, that's a great question. And uh, it really, so at one point in his chapter on London, toward the end, he contrasts a typical day in the life of a British gentleman, as he perceives it, with a typical day in the life of a Russian barin on the estate. Um, and so the English man is portrayed basically as a robot, somebody who's woken up by a machine, whose food is prepared by machines, who's dressed by machines. Um, and then the body in contrast is like very, very organic. So this Russian world is, there are no technological elements and there are no mechanical elements. And this idea of sort of reliance on machines or being mechanically evaluated is absent. So I think it really casts for him into relief, like what is a, a Russian response to these elements of um, modernity emerging in the mid 19th century. Uh, and we see that again with that adoption of the Oblomov persona all the way through is, you know, this is the Russian traveler, this Oblomov like traveler is quite different from his perception of the British traveler who would go around and, and see everything in exploitative terms uh, to be used or to be somehow harnessed to the use of something else. Um, so getting back to his, his trip about um, trip across Siberia. So they, they, they go back, they're dropped off at the mouth of the Amur River. And then this Oblomov like person, Goncharov, um, has to travel six months overland. Earlier, you and I, before this, had been talking about how he had gathered all of these material possessions from London and had what and he had to like what slowly discard them, <laughs> get rid of them as he was going across Siberia because there wasn't he wasn't capable of holding on to everything. Yeah, no, and well, so one of the interesting elements of the London chapter is the shopping. So the London stores are really a big attraction for everyone uh, in the expedition, not just Gancharov, but Gancharov turns out to be a huge shopper and it's almost like he can't control himself. You know, he's buying umbrellas and all kinds of things in the London stores. And then they get, yes, and when you're walking across Siberia, it becomes really difficult to carry all of these things. Um, and so he, there's a, a famous incident where he has this umbrella that he really likes from London, but it's just too awkward to carry. And so he tries to get rid of it, but his servant is more attached to it even than he is. And the servant refuses <laughs> to throw it away. And so the servant then carries it all the way back to St. Petersburg. So where I think in the end, you know, he ends up selling it for a great sum. So it's, uh, these commodities travel with them, right? That's hilarious. And I see the parallel, you know, from the 1850s to the 1990s, you know, the, the Russians are, you know, they don't rely on machines. They have a more natural way of life. And, but then they're crazy shoppers when there's an opportunity, you know, I mean, yeah. it's, it's the, so much about this is just the human condition, I think. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. So we're going to transition into a discussion about the frontier, Siberia as the frontier. And this is a great transition point because in Goncharov's book, Brigat Palada, in the last chapter where he's describing, or the end of the book where he's describing his trip across Siberia, it really provides a window for us into how he perceived Siberia as the eastern frontier um, of the, the Russian Empire. Um, and some thoughts around the frontier, um, what the frontier meant to Russians, what Siberia meant, Russian national identity, Siberia as part of that identity. Can you talk a little bit about what we learned about Siberia and about Kancharov's view of Russia as he was traversing Siberia? Absolutely, yeah. No, this is so. This um, reading Fregat Palada, I was initially interested in his time more in the West, but then I became fascinated by the trip across Siberia and that this is a developing place in the mid 19th century it's a, you know much of it is only under recently under russian control so it's very new um i guess i would maybe preface what i'm saying to say first of all there are multiple frontiers in russian history and siberia is a specific one um which you know for for quite a long time uh russians saw parallels with the us in terms of how they thought about siberia and there were times in the 19th century where people would refer to it as a new america or another version of america because they saw this eastward expansion like land expansion is very contiguous very similar to the us expansion you know to the west um so for Gunshirov, getting sort of dropped off there and having to go 
across it from the outer edge back to the center rather than the other way around is really this process of kind of trying to reconcile, you know, what is this space? Is it part of Russia or not? Um, and I, you know, and this is a kind of a question that hangs over that space throughout the 19th century. And he, on the one hand, sees many things that are familiar and that do remind him of provincial Russia, I should say, of like the countryside. But then there are other elements that just don't fit. So there are a lot of different kinds of people inhabiting Siberia uh, and a lot of things that are not like um, that sort of heartland Russia. Um, I think one of the maybe sort of more important examples here is that serfdom, the institution, was not extended ended into Siberia. So it meant for quite a different dynamic in the 1850s from what you would have seen uh, closer to the sort of heartland of, of like what we would traditionally think of as Russia nation, right? Um, so uh, for, for Goncharov, it's like this constant um, toggling between this is so different and exotic and this is just like home and it's just like home in good ways but it's also just like home in bad ways there's like bureaucracy it's hard to get horses when you need them uh, you have to pay bribes to the drivers you know these are things that he's encountering that remind him um, of home but underneath all of that for Goncharov is this um, kind of persistent concern with homecoming in Russian culture that is a theme that he shares with writers like Gogol, um, you know, and maybe Trebayedov, and he refers to both of those authors in the description of Siberia, uh, where it's difficult to locate the home and to actually return to it. Um, so there's a sense that it's there, but he can't quite find it. And Siberia is this kind of uncanny space where it's home-like, but then you ultimately don't find home there. So I think this is, um, you know, some of the kind of concerns around identity that matter to Gunsharov, but also are pertinent to the time as a whole. In your article, <clears throat> you quote a part of his book, um, a passage from his book, um, where he notices that there are no serfs there and that there are no manor houses, you know, around which the villages are built. Um, what, was that something that he thought should have been there? Was that something he missed? Um, how, wh wh where, where did he come down on the, the, the question of serfdom? So that's a great question. <laughs> um, and I think it's a hard one to answer because as I was saying at the beginning, he's not black and white writer and he is somebody who is conflicted. I think is maybe the best word about serfdom. So on the one hand, he would recognize that, have re did recognize that this was not uh, a productive institution to continue and not something that was promising for the future. But he also clearly expresses nostalgia for that world of the estate and this kind of more organic um, world that is more tied to the land and is cyclical uh, rather than this maybe I would say kind of more capitalist or modern uh, perception of time being linear um, and of needing to use time productively. These are all things that Gunterov resists. Uh, and I think, you know, we can see both positive and negative things in that resistance and even in that nostalgia, even though we have to be obviously careful about that. But um, I think he's somebody who there's a lot of ambivalence around it. And it's a lot of, um, you know, on the one hand, recognizing there needs to be reform and change, but then not sure what's the best path forward and not necessarily convinced that following sort of British or American models is the right answer. So. So in your in your research about frontiers um, in Russia, you say there are many frontiers. What is the mythology in Russia about frontiers? And I am asking that now because we're gonna we're gonna talk a bit about the comparison between the American West and the Russian East or the Russian American frontiers. What's the in Russia? What is the mythology around the frontier? Uh -huh. So yeah, and it's well, it's interesting because it is quite different in some ways from the U.S. version. Um, so I will say there's an important historian in the 19th century, uh, Solovyov, who writes about this expansion to the East in very negative terms, uh, suggesting that um, the movement away from central Russia is a drain on the population and on the society, and it sort of takes away the best elements. So there tended to be this kind of more negative idea about it. But then there are certain uh, other thinkers like Aksakov, who maybe I'll talk about in a minute, who see it in a different way, uh, maybe a little bit closer to the American version. Um, I'd also mention that there's this 
debate in the 19th century that we sometimes refer to as the sword or samovar debate, which is, okay, expansion to the East, um, do we do it by military means or do we do it by civil, like civilizing means? Uh, so would we sort of go out there with force or not? Um, and I think, you know, someone like Gancharov would probably position themselves more in the samovar camp, you know, that this is an idea that it's a civilizing mission. And this of course has parallels to the US version too. Um, but I think there tends to be more focus on the civilizing uh, aspect of things in the Russian context, um, more anxiety about what the frontier might be doing to society, uh, and then maybe less of attention to violence. I would, I would have guessed that about Goncharov. You mentioned again in your article a, um, a passage where he saw a little town outside of Irkutsk and made a comparison to old Rus, you know, mm -hmm. And so like seeing the, the old, you know, um, traditional Russian um, presence in Siberia um, sort of pointed, I think pointed to how he would want that kind of, how he would prefer that kind of um, civilizational transition um, on the frontier. Um, so then I have one more, there's one more picture here of him on the boat. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've done some research, research where you've compared two films, a, a Soviet documentary and a Russian Western. Um, can you talk a little bit about these? And what I thought I would do is um, click through these slides and you can sort of tell us sort of what's the point you're making, because this is a, a comparison of the American frontier as portrayed in one film, The Iron Horse, and the, um, a, a part of the Russian frontier from Central Asia to Siberia. Um, in, in that film, um, 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 what, what's it called? Turksib. Turksib, yeah, yeah, exactly. I was trying to think of what are the two words that <laughs> come together. Um, so can you tell us a bit about that and, and what that those films mean for this, this story? Absolutely, yeah. So um, this project grew out of my interest in 19th century, you know, sort of frontier mythologies. And I got interested in the early 20th century and in the Soviet period. So The Iron Horse is one of the, so American director John Ford, it's one of his early films, but it was a breakout movie for him. And John Ford became like absolutely legendary director of Westerns. The Iron Horse is about the Transcontinental Railroad, the completion of that in the US in the 1860s. Um, and uh, it's part of what we actually call a sub-genre of Westerns, which is the Railroad Western, <laughs> which is a movie about the train. Um, and then Turksib is uh, Victor Turin's film from 1929. So Iron Horse, 1924, and then Turksib from 1929. Um, I should, it's kind of interesting to note that Turin actually had emigrated to the US in the early 20th century, and he worked in Hollywood uh, actually in the early 1920s, and then he went back to the Soviet Union and remained there. Um, so it's not a, um, not an accident that he's bringing a lot of Hollywood ideas to uh, Soviet filmmaking. Um, and also, obviously, he would have seen or at very least have heard of the Iron Horse. So the Iron Horse is um, about this epic construction of the railroad and Turksib is also about epic construction of the railroad, but it has a different task. So we tend to, you know, the, the conventional thinking about the American West and up until the early 20th century, and here I'm thinking of Frederick Jackson Turner, which some listeners may have heard of him, you know, was very influential. He had this idea of the frontier hypothesis, which is, you know, not something we would accept today, but the idea was that the frontier was out there on the border, on the edge, that the American nation was generated in its most pure form and that democracy was spontaneously created on the frontier, but also kind of capitalism that it's, you know, these two things are sort of linked in his theory and in the way many people thought about it into the early 20th century. So with Turksib, the project's a little different because it's maybe the frontier can be a place where the Soviet nation uh, comes into being and is, in, is generated, but this has to be a socialist frontier, not a capitalist frontier. Um, so I was really interested in how Turin makes his own railroad Western, but he makes it as a socialist railroad Western. So um, instead of hostility between locals, indigenous people, and the sort of Soviet officials who come in to build the railroad, there's a harmonious relationship. The real struggle is with the land itself. Um, there's a much greater emphasis on the sort of uh, 
amazing or awesome aspects of the technology of the train. Uh, and then like here we see the camel sniffing the train tracks. Um, this first encounter between a kind of uncivilized East and then the civilizational force that's coming. Um, and in the movie presents that image to us as something positive. Uh, but we know in the American tradition, there are many images like this painting from around the same time period where there's a kind of inevitability about this progress that's presented, but also an anxiety and an, an elegiac kind of mode. There's a sadness that something is being lost and something's going to be changed. And for any American viewer of a painting like this, knowing what the fate of Native Americans is, it's hard not to see this um, as potentially uh, a, a kind of an image of mourning in as much as as an image of celebration. Right, uh, I mean, this image sense. comes across more as a, a divide rather than a connector. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, something has bisected their plane of existence. So, uh, and it's not it's not going away, right? So this right. is a permanent thing, yeah. So, um, but I think in, in Turin's film, there's an attempt to kind of maybe not give way to that anxiety so it's not as present but then by using an image that so directly recalls images like this it brings that anxiety back in so like it's still there to some extent well so you say that in in um Turin's, um film it was a documentary but it was it was um probably not a hundred percent um documentary yeah, yeah. If, if, obviously if, if, if he was um it was all about the happiness and the goodwill um, a, a, a you know a socialist economy bringing everyone together to build this real railroad. How much of that was uh, his real um, his real idea, and how much of that was what, was this a propaganda film? Well, so I would have to say the short answer is is yes. Um, so, and it's a documentary in the sense that we think of some documentaries today. It's more like in the style of a documentary um, rather than an actual documentary. Um, so it's it's a film that's meant to teach the Soviet audiences back home about this kind of expansion and and this bringing this modernity to this uh, primitive world. Um, we know that in reality there were conflicts over the building of the Turksib and there certainly were labor disputes and there was unrest among the indigenous populations over it. So it's, um, but that's not present in the film at all. Um, whereas I will say in the John Ford film, right, you do see, this is a great example, right? This Native American groups are attacking the train. Um, the, the brave, uh, you know, folks on the train are fighting them off. Um, so there's a very direct um, confrontation with the violence, but then is harnessed to still a very propagandistic story about American expansion and American progress. So um, both films, I would say, are guilty of the propaganda epithet. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I haven't watched the American film, but um, it does, I, I've, I've seen a few scenes and it does seem to have a very happy ending. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually a great movie. It's fun to watch. So if you're if you're ever interested in watching it, I, I I have found it more enjoyable than I would have expected. Does it does it really feel like a western? It does, yeah, because there's this kind of the fights with the Native Americans, and then um, you know there's well, what's interesting that's maybe less like a westerner. There are also labor disputes among the workforce building the railroad. Um, we know in in the real history, right? Those disputes often centered around the use of Chinese uh, laborers to build it. Um, but in the movie, it's framed as a dispute with Italian workers who are recent immigrants, and they have to be sort of instructed in the ways of of, of the American workforce. And um, but the the evil railroad boss also has to be uh, taken down a peg or two and made to respect his workers more. So. Okay. American qualities. Um, so also on the, the question of the frontier, we have um, Sergei Aksakov, a well-known Slavophile. Was he as well-known at that time as a Slavophile? Slavophile well, so and it's an interesting term because it's, his sons were very famous, yeah. uh, Slavophiles, Konstantin and Ivan. Um, and he He's a little more, maybe I would say, not fully in the Slavophile camp, partly because it's not fully developed yet when he's writing. Mm -hmm. um, but he had this fascinating background, you know, where his grandfather had picked up and moved 
um, from kind of central Russia to what was then Bashkiria, uh, you know, and not just moved himself and his family, but moved the entire village, like hundreds of serfs and everybody out to this eastern frontier, which was the norm, right? This is what you would do if you were a landowner and you wanted to leave, move out to the more frontier spaces, but it was very expensive, challenging thing to do. Um, and so then Aksakov grows up there and writes a family chronicle and the childhood years of Bagrov, the grandson. And they're just these amazing novels that are so underappreciated. Um, and I know I was talking with you earlier that Michael Katz is giving us a new translation of this in English. And I'm really excited for that because um, a family chronicle is just, it's a wonderful book. And it's very much about this real geohistorical, like, place and time that he grows up in, but it's also a really interesting psychological portrait of his parents who were very, um, very different people and had a very complicated marriage, not a very happy one. Uh, and his, I just was always blown away by how perceptive Aksakov is and how well he's able to describe these dynamics between them. And it's, you know, many decades before we get Freud or any other kind of language like that. So what were, um, what were his impressions of this um, Bashkiria and this, did he perceive it as a frontier land? Did he feel like he was outside or on the edge of Russia? Absolutely. Um, and he's very keenly aware of this as a Eurasian space. Like, so this is not Russia proper, um, but it's also Russia. So there's this ambiguity or sort of tension around that. Uh, and I would, you know, arguably, I think that Aksakov, because the American writer James Fenimore Cooper, who we usually associate with classics like The Last of the Mohicans, Aksakov knew his work and it was very popular in Russia. So I think he thinks about the career or the frontier in some ways in a similar way. Um, and I would say Aksakov is kind of in an argument with Solovyov and the historian I mentioned earlier. He doesn't see this as a drain on Russian society. He sees that as a space, again, precisely of this kind of place where the Russian nation itself can be created and generated, um, but partly by drawing on this Eurasian-ness. Um, so it's not, it's not the sort of folk culture so much as it is this more kind of hybrid space. Um, and this is where, you know, he particularly um, talks about this encounter with kumis, which is fermented mare's milk. And he's a very early proponent of drinking this uh, and was something that would become a major industry in the later 19th century for the taking of the kumis cure. Um, Aksakov, it doesn't exist yet when he, when he writes about it, but he sees it as almost a magical substance that by imbibing it, you know, he becomes sort of one with this uh, space and becomes kind of the embodiment of this uh, maybe more Eurasian kind of identity that he sees as a strength. Um, so, and I will say that, sorry, the Kumis cure is still alive and well. So I think that it's still very popular. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. So did the Kumis cure, the drinking of this milk of Amer, did it take over Russia? Or did it become a craze or was it always sort of out on the borderlands? No, it does become quite popular. Like Tolstoy actually was a big, uh, you know, a big fan of the Kumis cure. And he actually, I think I'm trying to remember correctly, he he had uh, people and mares brought, or no, he bought land uh, and near sort of in this region where Aksakov was writing about. And he um, had like a small uh, house there and he took the cure many times. Um, but in fact, they even imported it to London, places like that. So in the late 19th century, you could take the cure uh, elsewhere, but it was considered inferior because it wasn't, you know, the milk wasn't as fresh and you weren't, the horses weren't eating the right kind of grass and things like that. So it's it's a big deal, yeah. Interesting. And so these are some, some you have some photos here of of what? So these are way, much past Aksakov's own time, but this is from late 19th, early 20th century, when it does become um, a kind of a phenomenon to go and take the Kumis cure. So these are Kumisniki in the top picture. So these are people who are um, fermenting the milk. You have, there's a special process and you're supposed to use certain kinds of containers to do the process of fermentation. Uh, and then it looks like down below, there's a, a Kumis seller who's bringing it in barrels. Um, and then this is like Bashkirians in front of their house, uh, their sort of typical architecture. And it was it was in this specific area because of the grasses. Mm -hmm. they, yeah. The so these these steppe grasses are considered to be ideal, and and actually even only at certain times of year, like I think it's early spring. That's the best time to take the cure. Do they still do this? Oh yeah. No, you can go. I mean, if you look online, you'll see there are lots yeah. of places. Yeah. 
Have you I mean, I, I, no, but I thought about it. <laughs> I would love to try it. Although it actually sounds a bit challenging, um, you know, because you have to drink, if you really do the cure, you're supposed to drink like, I don't know, like 10 gallons a day or just some unbelievable amount that it's hard to imagine. And you don't eat anything else while you're doing it. So oh my gosh. it seems a little intensive, but. Um, and what is this? Do I see a sock of um, yes, yeah. name up there? Is this his home? So this is not his home, but it is his granddaughter. So she actually ran one of these Kumwe's Cure institutions later. So he was already, you know, long dead, but um, it remained a sort of tradition in the family and you could actually go there and take it. Um, and it was, you know, his book made it popular. So that's the other thing is like his novel, when it appears in mid 1850s, it kind of helps to even create the whole idea of taking a Kumwe's Cure. Before that, that's not something people in Moscow or St. Petersburg would have particularly thought about. What did, do we know what his two sons who were very strong proponents of, of, of Russian culture and Slavophilia, how, how did they, what were their impressions of the Russian borderland and their father's life in Bashkiria? That's a great the, the question. Integration yeah. of the non-Russian peoples with the Russian culture. So that's an excellent question. And the Slavophiles in general tended to sort of ignore or not pay attention to the multi-ethnic uh, status of the Russian empire. So they did not embrace this. Um, they didn't reject their father or his writing, but they certainly weren't interested in it. Um, and it's one of the ways in which it makes it hard to place Aksakov himself in the Slavophile camp because he's obviously so shaped by his experience growing up um, and in what we'd call Bashkiria then and then, and his interest in it and his love of it. So he's, you know, he's more uh, interested in that picture of Russian identity than his sons. But of course, Aksak, if he left Bashkiria, he moved to Petersburg, he became a theater critic. And I'm not sure that his sons would have traveled to his uh, home estate. If they did, it was maybe, you know, once or twice, but they certainly didn't spend time there and the family became sort of urban and Petersburg. Uh, so that would be one reason why his sons might have a different outlook. Sure. Um, and speaking of the Kumis cure, uh, cure, another segue, another an American who wrote about the Kumis um, cure, I can't even say that, <laughs> Sorry. Um, is um, Isabel Hapgood who um, is this, um, oh, I would love for you to describe who she was because she's a, a fascinating character in her own right and, and a, a huge expert on Russia who um, traveled there, translated a lot of um, Russian books, was a major translator of Tolstoy um, back in the mid to late 1800s, or I guess the early 1900s too. Um, and I think it was through your research on the Cumis Cure that led you to her, I believe. Can you tell us who she is and how how she um, fits into this story? Mm -hmm, absolutely. So yes, while I was researching about the Cumis Cure, I actually had trouble initially finding a lot of information about it, and it's you know it's less written about. Um, and so eventually I saw a mention of an account by an American woman visitor uh, in the 18, um, late 1880s, which really piqued my interest because I wasn't that aware of American women visitors. Um, so Isabel Hapgood, she is, you're right, quite a character. Uh, she's kind of this stalwart Yankee matron, um, you know, from New England in the late 19th century. She's interesting. She did not attend university. That wasn't a possibility for her at the time. Um, but she more or less somehow learned Russian um, in the US in the 1870s and 1880s. In some degree, she was self-taught, but I think she also worked with Russian immigrants and so she learned. Um, and she just becomes really fascinated and hooked on, on Russia. And particularly initially her interest was in the Russian Orthodox uh, liturgy. So she did a lot of translation of Russian Orthodox church music. Um, and then eventually she makes a trip to Russia for two years with her mother, um, who's sort of this elderly uh, widow. And uh, they end up traveling all around and they go out on the Volga and they go all the way out to, you know, Bashkiria and they take the Kumis cure. Um, but they weren't actually that excited about it <laughs> uh, because because it made them feel very uncomfortable, like gastrointestinally, but they they appreciated the um, the effort. 
but she's a really interesting figure because she, like I said, she teaches herself Russian and she starts translating Russian literature. She's not the only person to do this at the time, but she's one of the most important figures to do this. So she, for the first time, translates novels by Tolstoy, by um, Turgenev, uh, and it's part of, it becomes this absolute craze in American society at the time. It was actually called the Russia craze or the Tolstoy craze, where people were just like buying up these translations like hotcakes and they're really, really interested in, uh, and particularly in Tolstoy. So his legend at that time was sort of that image of him as this mystical uh, teacher and spiritual figure was very pronounced already in the US. So there, you know, that's part of the interest in him. Uh, and then Hapgood, she goes to Russia. She actually meets Tolstoy. She and her mother spend time at Gasna Polyana. They, it's like a week or so that they spend there. Um, and she develops a relationship with him and she becomes his main um, English translator in the US for a while. Um, and then she has a strong personality and um, she did not like the Kreutzer Sonata, you know, which is Tolstoy's story about uh, adultery and murder. Um, and she considered those themes to be too strong for the public and she refused to translate. It. So um, Tolstoy moved on to other translators and she uh, kind of broke with him, um, except that during the famine in the 1890s, she was in Russia, she was instrumental in raising a lot of money and sending it to Tolstoy, who also then raised a lot of money. And so she contributed greatly to the famine relief. I still can't get past how much she translated as a, and maybe this is the, the my inner Oblomov, um, <laughs> completely flabbergasted. I mean, she tra I mean, she translated Tolstoy, um, Leskov, um, mm -hmm. Unin, the, um, the brothers Karamazov. Mm -hmm. uh, were, have you read any of her translations? Are they any good? How can how can this be? <laughs> well, so and that's a good question. I will say, you know. I have, I teach Russian literature in English and I still have students get it out of the library and they'll have like the constant Scarnet translation. It's still right. floating around. No one has ever turned up with the Isabel Hapgood translation. Wow. Um, so, and I kind of felt like my worst fears about her were realized when I read um, a note, somebody who had visited Tolstoy, a Russian friend of his left a note in his own diary that there was this American there who is a very loud woman, rather large, and she spoke Russian terribly. <laughs> so oh, that was like, you know, this was kind of my fear that the self-taught, you know, Isabel might right. not actually be uh, as fluent as she thought right. she was. And right. she had a very high opinion of her own abilities, um, but it's also really hard to be a woman in the 1890s who's trying to position themselves as an expert or an authority on this other place. So um, is she, she definitely tries to sort of go in swinging and see if she can convince everyone that she's an expert. Right. Well, we should, and, and you know, give credit where credit's due. She was very in, instrumental in, um, you know, going, you know, circling back to the whole reason for the speaker series. She was instrumental in establishing Russian studies as a university level field of, of, of study, right? Yes, um, she absolutely was. He wrote a couple of articles in really high profile American journals like The Nation, where she says we need to have um, an established field of study of Russian. Um, the, the interesting thing for Hapgood is I think on some level she wanted to be the person who would be the first professor of Russian studies, but she hadn't gone to university. And you know, in the 1890s in the US, it's not a realistic possibility that a woman would have that role. So when she calls, makes this call to create a position, she actually has this sort of hilarious description of what's needed to be a Russian professor in the United States. And she says that that person should speak Russian, Polish, um, I can't remember, it's like Czech, Bulgarian, Macedonian, like she literally lists every Slavic language. And then she says, and nobody except for me speaks all of those <laughs> languages. Um, and so I, you know, I would question whether she really spoke all of them, but, uh, you know, other people quickly responded saying, you know, we don't ask German professors to speak Icelandic and Swedish. We just want them to speak German pretty well, you know? So, um, so she's, she's really a quite, as I said, quite a strong willed personality, but it's also so challenging as a woman at that period to make yourself heard and to be regarded as an expert that I think she has to kind of almost act more like a man than a man in the same position would. So uh, it's, it was fascinating. Speaking of a man in the same or similar position, um, George Kennan, um, mm -hmm. the, the competition that she had with him to out-Russian him um, mm -hmm. is fascinating. And it, it sounds like, I mean, this was uh, what, you, what your research was on, how she would um, make a point in her descriptions of Russia because she spent a couple years there and then she wrote this 
this interesting long book uh, about literally rambling through Russia, wandering through Russia, where she took the communist cure. cure. Um, but I thought it was interesting that in her descriptions of Russia, she made a point to be more descriptive, to name more plants and animals and, and, and um, more um, um, details than George Kennan ever did so that she would be perceived as the smarter, more knowledgeable expert on Russia. Yes, and so the, the thing I would mention here is, so this is George Kennan Sr. I think he's the great right. uncle of George F. Kennan who had, um, you know, been invited to Russia to write about the prison camp system, et cetera. Uh, and he ended up becoming absolutely enormous celebrity in the United States. It's hard for us to imagine now, but he had this like two year speaking tour where he was just giving a talk about Russia every night in, an, in a different city. And he's getting lots of money for it and an incredible amount of attention. And Hapgood just almost from the get go kind of sets herself against him, that he's kind of a charlatan and she's the real expert. Um, and her tone often in Russian rambles is, you know, everyone has these wild misperceptions of Russia and she's going to correct them. And she's, she's the only person who understands how things really work. Um, so she's really, really competitive with him. Um, and, but I would say sort of sadly, both for George Kennan and Hapgood, as they actually began to create the first professorships in Russian studies, and it was like around 1892, 1893, both she and Kennan get sidelined. So they're, they're not part of this new academic institutional structure of Russian studies. And, and ultimately sort of by the 19 teens and twenties, their voices are no longer present. Um, Though, where, so where, where, who sidelined them? Was this, is this another, is this something Harvard did to them? I would say it's more just the process, you know, is that so Harvard has the first professorship and then University of Chicago um, and they hire kind of their own people uh, for the role. And in the case of Chicago, they hired the son of the president of the university who didn't speak Russian. He had spent some time there, but he had no interest in it. So it was a sort of a weird dynamic. Um, I, th I think that the, you know, academic institutions have an interest maybe in protecting their turf. And so they start to say, well, we really are the experts, right? Because we're at Harvard, we're at Chicago, and these other people are uneducated, they're untrained, they're not professionalized. Um, and as certainly in the case of Kennan, he's such a celebrity that he's almost more of an entertainer. So it's easier to maybe dismiss him. Um, and then Hapgood as a woman who's not, you know, university educated, it's also easier to dismiss her once you actually create an, a field, an academic discipline. And Hapgood's um, relationship with Tolstoy, she spent time with him at Yasna, um, Yasnaya Pol um, Poliana. Um, um, they had this falling out over the Kreutzer Sonata, but she had translated many of his works. How, how, what were their interactions like? I, I think it's very fascinating that at that time, a lot of um, people were visiting Tolstoy, including Americans. Um, Kennan had visited and Hapgood visited. What was that? dynamic like. Mm -hmm. um, and Ka Hapgood is one of the earlier American visitors. So I think Kennan and maybe one other person from the US had been. Um, but her dynamic with him is also very interesting and in some ways surprising. Tolstoy is already really a legend. I mean, he's a very big deal. And like you say, there are a lot of visitors coming. Um, but Hapgood really sort of goes head to head with him. Like she almost wants to show that she's smarter than him, um, which I find just amazing, you know, for one thing, it's Tolstoy, right? Like I would, <laughs> if I got to meet him, I don't think I would want to like challenge him to an intellectual duel. But um, I think, you know, it's part of her whole thing of sort of showing that she's qualified to write about him and to translate him um, and to speak about him authoritatively to an American audience. But I think she's also just very caught up in her competition with Kennan. And she's really trying to show that she's better at debating with Tolstoy than Kennan was. So Kennan and Hapgood both, they try to kind of draw him out on a couple of points. Um, and Kennan you know, in his text, every time he says, well, I just, I kind of gave up because I didn't agree with Tolstoy, you know, about various issues, but I didn't want to argue with him. And mm -hmm. Hapgood tries to keep arguing with him. Um, right. And then she says that Tolstoy became silent and, you know, that this is the sign of her victory. I think for most of us reading it, we wonder whether this is a sign of victory or just that he, you know, decided right. not to engage with her anymore. Right. But. He just gave up. Mm -hmm. So uh, one last question before we wrap up again about Tolstoy. Um, I know that you're currently teaching War and Peace, and um, I love to hear 
how American students are responding to that novel and to Tolstoy and to Russia in the um, 19th century. Um, what is your experience teaching that course now? How are your students liking it? Well, it's my favorite class to teach. Uh, and I do teach it every year. So I've now read War and Peace, I don't know, like 12 times or something, it's a lot. Um, but students really like it. Um, you know, it takes a little while for them to get into it, but I think it's a really important book for people to read at the age of 20 to 25. Um, it's a, you know, these main characters, Pierre, Andre, Nikolai, and Natasha, they're all kind of that age and they're trying to figure out their lives and what to do with those lives and how to live a good life. Um, and they're also, you know, Tolstoy uh, really promotes a very deterministic philosophy, especially in the second half of the book. So these characters are grappling with how much agency they have in their lives. And I often find with the American college students that reading this book is maybe the first time that they really contend with that question, which is, you know, is it all under my control or not? Um, is it, am I a terrible failure if it doesn't go the way I want it to go, you know, or is the success all due to me? Um, and this is a question that is quite, um, you know, captivating to them because they just haven't really contended with it. Sometimes they've literally never thought about this. And it tends to be the case that in American society, I think we emphasize this idea of total agency, that, you know, everything is up to you. Um, so somebody presenting you with a world in which nothing is up to you, and it's really the opposite, it does at least make you think, right? I mean, you have to ask some questions and think about your own life. Um, so like I always say in class that they don't have to agree with Tolstoy, but they have to understand the philosophy he's putting forward. And then they really have to think about how everything that happens in the narrative is part of that philosophy for Tolstoy. Um, but of course, they also really like to talk about the romantic relationships in the book um, and just the kind of like seeing the terrible self-destructive patterns of a character like Pierre, you know, things like that. Um, I think it's it's always a lot of fun to talk with them about it. And, you know, we try, I try to structure the class as much as possible as kind of discussion rather than lecture. So we get them kind of giving their uh, reactions to what's happening in the book. I don't know if you can see on the wall behind me. So um, they have to write two papers about War and Peace over the semester. So those are their serious assignments. But then at the end of the semester, when they're finished, um, I give them a short assignment where they make a one page cartoon version of War and Peace. So 16 squares, you could kind of, I don't know, see a few examples up there behind me. Um, and then last year for the first time, I gave them the option to do either do the cartoon or to do like a three minute video of one of their favorite scenes. They had to act it out. So we had some great examples of people acting out Pierre's duel with Dolokhov and things like <laughs> things like that. So that sounds, it's, a, it's fun. It sounds like a lot of fun. Well, this was a lot of fun. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we talked about a lot of different things. Um, to our audience, thank you for your comments, questions. Thanks for joining us today. And I hope to see you again soon. It's Ingrid and everyone, thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.